Your chance to help the police now on BBC One Crime Watch UK with Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce. Crime Watch live and interactive, the programme where you make the difference. Tonight. The student set upon by thugs, one nearly lost his life, Excuse another's me, lost an eye. Right hey, do you call me a washi? Hey, go back to the Taliban. The man so reckless he attacked a schoolgirl beside a busy road, but her description might be good enough to nail him. And the robbery on Merseyside that turned to farce. You haven't seen a woman round here with a plan, have you? Mrs. I owe her money, but I'm keeping the head low, if you know what I mean. A Friday night out in Birmingham. A few drinks, a bit of a laugh. As long as you don't come across four yobs, age late teens to early twenties, three white, one black, all nasty. This is the story of three university students who ran into them about six weeks ago. <laughs> out there tonight, weren't they? It's freezing! What are we going to do now? Oh, I'm going to meet the guys up in the restaurant. Are there? Yeah, they said they drove there. I'm not even hungry, though. Well, let's, let's get chips, then. Hey, mate, where's all the funny? <laughs> hey, where's all the funny? I've got a funny. What are you doing on the weekends? Your own business, mate? Wait, should you just call my mate? We'll see. What's going on? It's all right, mate. Just ignore him, OK? It's... Yeah, we'll turn to shut up then. What's all that about? Nothing, man. He was just giving me lip, that's all. Come on. You get banter every Friday night when you go out, but what I felt was that someone was looking to be provoked. What? I'm starving. Oh, later. Oh, look, they're right there. They're right by the food counter. Look, let's just get the car and go over, all right? Hey, do you call me a washi? Hey, go back to the Taliban. Yeah, go back to your own country. Go get an education thought that was the end of it and we just continued to walk but that wasn't the end of it the lads from earlier were joined by two others you know they're following us Oi! come on then ignore it let's just get home it's getting a bit serious so i thought i'd kind of defuse the situation where anything bad happens look he didn't mean it whatever he said i noticed he had a bottle in his hand I've lost a sight in my left eye and there's some scars on my face but they're going to heal but the eyesight itself is gone then they basically started hitting me I remember one of them using a bottle I didn't realize how serious it was until the doctors sat me down and said look you could have easily lost your life it's very sort of scary the thought that you know you can just lose your life because of some idiots as I was uh, approaching, you can see two youths kicking a uh, light on the floor. So I flashed my lights and pressed my horn. Stop that! And as soon as I did that, they made a run for it. I looked to the left, and there was one light on the floor. They uh, cut across into Turner Street, where another at least uh, two lights joined them and they kept on running. At the end of Tennant Street, they turned into Bishopsgate Street. Were you one of this group that they passed outside the city tavern? The last time the security cameras picked them up was on Broad Street near the Five Ways roundabout. Did they get into a taxi? Do you remember them? And although the CCTV is poor, do you recognise them as a group? I do look at things a lot differently now. I used to be a lot more broad-minded before the attack. I used to have a lot of sort of friends of different cultures and races. I'm always more precautious, if you like. I'm always thinking the worst. Well, I still kind of have nightmares now. Half the day I'm normal, and then half the time I'm kind of depressed because I can't, I 
can't help but think about the attack, especially when I'm sleeping. I'm always having kind of like nightmares about the whole thing. A broken bottle to the eye, a kicking to the head. They're very lucky it's not a murder charge. If you know any of those four, if you recognise that group or any of the men that group, 0500 600 600 here in the studio or the incident room, 0845 113 5000. Now take a look at these two muggers. They're following their target and what's worse, they've got a gun. My normal train is 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening. On that night, I was at a client and worked late. Two men walking in the opposite direction spot him, turn back and follow him through the station. I wasn't aware of being followed at all when I came off the train and out of the station. There's normally quite a few commuters from London coming out of the station. Unfortunately, that night there was only me. They kept him in sight along the main road, just waiting for the right opportunity. I was thinking of my plans for the next two days. I was due to fly to Belfast early in the morning, thinking basically to get up early, get an early flight. I was walking up the path, two men suddenly appeared behind me. One put his arm around my neck and held it tightly so that I could hardly talk. The other had a gun to my head. They asked me, what have I got? And I said, my wallet. Took the wallet and they also took my mobile phone. And they took the laptop, then told me to lie on the floor. Lie down! Lie down! Told me to cover my head with my arms and not to look up for five minutes or else they would shoot me. And I was terrified. They hurried back down the high street and spotted a local taxi firm. Through the hatch, I could only actually see one of them. He was West Indian. He had a Jamaican accent, early 20s. My first impression was he was very rude. He was obviously in a very big hurry to make sure he got a cab instantly. He asked to go to Stanmore Station. They obviously didn't know the area very well. During the journey, they were talking on a mobile phone to somebody in Milton Keynes. I could hear them unzipping a bag, and they were talking about computer chips. As we were approaching the roundabout at Brockley Hill, the area started to get built up. Hey, this looks more like London. Yeah, how far is it to go, mate? They hadn't got a clue as to that area. I pulled up outside the station. They paid me no problem at all, and that would be the last I actually saw of them. Well, we're calling them the away day muggers because they were clearly off their usual patch. Who are they? Look again at their faces, but especially the white one with a woolly hat. You get a great view of him. And who were they speaking to on the phone in Milton Keynes? 0500 600 600. Now, some more CCTV. Here's the head of Sussex CID, Jeremy Payne. Take a look at these clips and see if you, you can give us the names. An elderly woman answered her front door to what she thought was a delivery man. He pushed his way in and was followed by these two. They tied her up and threatened her husband with a knife, forcing him to hand over jewellery. They escaped in a red Astra van. This woman was collecting her pension in the post office. The man behind her asked the way to the chemist. As she left, a man pushed her and grabbed her handbag. We want to identify this man who may have useful information. A man in a jewellers in Buckinghamshire distracted the assistant and grabbed a tray of jewellery. A week later, a different jewellers and this man asked to look at some rings. Staff insisted on locking the door while they examined them. He soon left saying he would come back later. Could this be the same man? If you've got any names for us, call us now, 0500 600 600. September the 11th, the day of the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks, and a day, of course, few people will forget. In the week that followed, the news from America dominated everything. 
But for a family in Bexley Heath in Kent, there's something else they won't forget, on a quite different scale, but an outrage nonetheless. OK, that's it, everyone. Homeworking on Monday, test on Chapter 5 on Friday, and no excuses. My daughter's a very vivacious girl. She's always quite enjoyed going to school, and mainly probably because of the social aspect of it. Yeah, I did. Oh, brilliant. Can I copy it off you? She'll walk home with her friends after school, and they spend a lot of time chatting and dawdling, so it can take longer than, than necessary, really. I might be able to go shopping on Saturday. I like going shops in town. I saw this little shoulder top, this little red one. It's really pretty. She's got the same friends that she had um, from primary school, and there's a group of them that have stayed in contact. And she sees them frequently. They're always either at her house or she's at their houses. It's just a, a normal day and I came home early and um, my son was here and one of my friends um, after work. So are you having second thoughts about going then? Well, it's not till December, so uh, mind you, you don't want to get on a plane now, do you, after all that? Well, my brother rang at the weekend and he said, you know, did I still want to go? And well, did I want to, you know, cancel the tickets, but... I'll go if you don't want to. No, I'm going, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> That was so disgusting. Tell me about it. Listen, let me know about Saturday, yeah, and I'll get yeah. my mum to call Make, my make mom. sure she does. I will. All right, see I'll do it. it. Right. Did you see that thing in the paper about they're taking sharp objects, scissors, oh, bars, yeah. and all that? See, they're being so careful. I know. All right, love. What are we doing for photo? Oh, yeah. You staying? Um. Yeah, go on. You sure? Yeah. Save me cooking. Yeah. yeah, anyway, it's takeaway yeah. night tonight, so oh, it's no good. problem. The A2 is up to speeds and moving nicely at the moment, but do expect a fairly rapid. Right, what do you want? I'll have a, a prawn, king prawn, chili garlic bowl tea. <laughs> Your breath's going to smell the water. I don't know what I like. Okay. <laughs> She described the attacker as muscular, around five foot eight. He was about 27 or 28 years old, with very short cropped, mousy coloured hair and a long, stubbly face. She was sexually assaulted just beside the Dover-bound carriageway of the A2. He was reckless. Lots of people used this alleyway, especially around 4.15 in the afternoon. He had an electric blue t-shirt, a dark coloured jacket with a bright orange lining and scruffy jogging bottoms splashed with paint. He had short stubby fingers with bitten nails and a rough London accent. It was unusual for me to be home. I wasn't normally home at that early in the afternoon and she just really came screaming through the door. <laughs> oh, darling. What's happened? What's the matter? What's the matter? <laughs> Darling, what's the matter? What's wrong? Come on, tell me. It was a nightmare because my daughter had gone from someone that was really outgoing and carefree to being absolutely terrified. Um, she couldn't be left alone at all. I mean, even to go out of the room and leave her was was awful. She, it was just unbearable for her. Oh, sweetheart. All right, darling. If I went up to have a bath, she'd follow me, and she was sitting outside the bathroom door. Don't leave me downstairs on my own. It was really awful, you know. <laughs> Yelly. What, what do you mean? What's happened? <laughs> she's moved on so much, really, that she's really independent now. Again, you know, which is how she always was. She's very independent, strong will. She's. She's got a lot of support from her school friends and it was them that actually managed to get her to walk down the alleyway recently, which was obviously quite frightening. Susan, broad daylight beside one of the busiest roads in Britain. I mean, this guy was reckless. It was, it was crazy. He was. He was very reckless. Um, and we feel because of that that he may have committed uh, other criminal offences, not only sexual assaults, but, but other, other crimes. And we would appeal to anybody out there who may have suffered a similar attack to come forward. 
Now, what are the distinctive things about him? Apart, and we said he's, he's late 20s, 27, 28, something yeah. like that, this long, stubbly face. What else? Bitten nails, I think, on, on the fingers. That, that's, that stands out. And anything he said which was distinctive? He, he, he was very violent in his words as well as his actions, and he, he did threaten to slit the victim's throat. Um, he, he was, I gather, the victim said he was, he was much more violent than we've portrayed. Yes, yes, she did. Now, the clothing, the, the, the blue jacket with the orange lining, he's got this electric blue T-shirt, which, of course, he might have got rid of now, and, yeah. the, and the jogging bottoms splashed in paint, is splashed that right? Splashed in paint. Um, I mean, everyday clothes, but, but put together, um, you know, blue T-shirt, orange lining, it's quite bright, quite distinctive, and as you say, paint splattered trousers. And you don't think he necessarily comes from this area at all, basically, I mean, because it's no. by the A2, it could be anywhere. It could be. It, all we know is he's got a London accent. Yeah, um, he's got a London accent. Uh, Which is really anywhere in the southeast of England. It could be, and it could be that as it's on a main trunk road, he might not be a local man, he might have travelled into the area. We don't know where he went, went after after the attack, uh, but he went out the top of the alleyway into Upton Close, and that leads on to the A2. So he could have been local, or he could have got onto the A2 and away. This is an inquiry. It's been all over the place. We're down to the West Country, all over the place. So if you have any ideas who he is, and particularly if you think, uh, if you're a police officer, a prison officer, a probation officer, come into contact with someone like this, or if you've been attacked or frightened by somebody like this, give us a call, 0500 600 600 here in the studio. Or the instant room 020 8284 9246. Well, we've only been on air, what is it, 20 minutes, but we've got quite a few calls coming in already. That racist bottle attack, uh, the attack on those students there, names coming in. One person who thinks they might have been attacked by the same group of men. And also that mugging in Radlett in Hertfordshire, you know, where the man was getting off the train, they went after his laptop. Uh, the CCTV wasn't that great, but it was good enough for a few of you at least to recognise some of our muggers. We've got 40 police officers here. Keep those calls coming in. Now, more cases where Crime Watch calls have already made a difference. Just over a year ago, we showed this man stealing an eternity ring from a jeweller's in Surrey. Disappointingly, just one call came in, but it turned out to be the only one they needed. It named Glenn Gratton, and he was traced to Wandsworth Prison, where he was on remand for other offences. He's pleaded guilty to theft and been sentenced to two years, and he was ordered to pay £2,500 in compensation back to the jewellers. Anthony Fenwick failed to turn up at court to hear that he'd been found guilty of GBH, so he showed his face shortly before Christmas. One caller gave an address which eventually led to Eastbourne. Local police went round on New Year's Day and arrested him. He's just been sentenced to three and a half years. Paul Farnden, as he called himself, was wanted for forging company cheques, then paying them into his own account. We only had this fairly old photo, but several viewers knew him even so. He was working for London Underground, using his real name, Paul Williams. And after Crime Watch went out, he didn't show up for work. But detectives found a more recent photo, and after we reappealed, he handed himself in. He's pleaded guilty and been sentenced to 15 months. Still to come, what upset a Bristol man so badly, he confronted a man in the street and was killed. The armed robber in Liverpool reduced to running off empty-handed. And does this remind you of anyone? A face reconstructed from remains found on Exmoor. What made a mild-mannered man so angry that he kicked his own TV hard enough to gash his leg and angry enough then to confront someone in the street? If we knew, we'd know why Evan Jones was murdered. Evan was a great character. Some people might call him eccentric. Very caring about other people. Always concerned about what was going on here, about what was going on in the area. And He used to work as a volunteer at the Salvation Army until about 18 months ago, helping on their door, letting people in. We were always pleased to see Evan. Somehow, he'd always have a big hug for us, and... Yeah, he was a lovely man. Been out today? Yeah. <laughs> hey, John, fancy right. coming back to mine later on? I'll get a takeaway or something. No, I was going to stay here, Ev. No? No, don't mind. All right, please, I'll see you. See you later. 
Evan was divorced and spent most evenings in local pubs. He was a familiar face, often going from one to another. Evan had ordered a takeaway, and at 10.20, he went next door to pick it up. Evan had seemed in high spirits when he left the pub, but something badly upset him, either on the short walk home or inside his flat. He started his meal, but abandoned it half-eaten. A passerby saw him bleeding from a leg wound. I just wonder if you'd do me a favour. Would you, would you walk me to the hospital, the BRI? Only, uh, I've, I've cut my leg and I've lost quite a bit of blood, really. How'd you cut it? Well, I'll keep the telly. What do you want to do that for? I'm pissed off. I've got a bad day. Yeah, I'm sorry, mate. I can't. Oh, I've got on. someone looking after my kid. i got to go. I'm really sorry, mate. Evan seemed calm enough at this stage and went to make a phone call. But did something go badly wrong again? Something upset him enough to divert from the hospital and confront someone in Stokes Croft. Had he recognised his attacker from the assault the week before? Oh, shit! A white car swerved to avoid them in the street. You won't have forgotten if that was you. Two men were waiting at the bus stop. We need to hear from them. There were three people at the phone box. The couple have come forward, but who's the man who couldn't get through on his call? And a young man was standing at the corner using a mobile phone. Call us if that was you. Evan's assailant was smaller, maybe five foot six to eight, and younger, in his twenties or his thirties. Evan died as a result of the attack. His purse was now empty. Lots of people saw the assault, but may not have realized how serious it was. If you haven't spoken to the police, or if you know who is involved, call us now. 0500 600 600. So Hannah, you're Evans' daughter. Thanks very much for coming in. Your mum and dad had divorced quite a time ago and you, you kind of lost touch with him, but you were just beginning to re-establish a relationship, weren't you? Yeah, in, in the past couple of years, we'd, uh, we had contacts. Uh, I went to stay with him in his flat. He cooked me a curry and gave up his bed. Uh, we spoke on the phone frequently. And you were just beginning to find that you've got things in common, characteristics in common? Yeah, they, we, had, we had a lot of laughs, a lot of tears as well. Honesty, really, it was, we were both honest with each other. 
well, what kind of man was he? I mean, a lot of people in the in the reconstruction we showed, they said said what a kind man he was and how he'd put himself out for people. Yeah, he was a, a character, definitely. He, he had an infectious laugh. Uh, he, he, he was, he, his door was always open. He, he had a natural empathy for people. And he you, didn't judge at all. And you were just really trying to, to build bridges back to each other, weren't you? Just you know, after, after many years of not seeing each other. We were, yeah, and, and, we were, and, and it was very easy. We, we got on. We got on very well. Do you feel cheated by the fact that just as that was beginning to happen, now, now this has happened? I do. I, I, um, myself and my sister feel, feel terribly cheated. Um, it's unfortunate, very unfortunate. Well, it, it certainly is that. I mean, people are watching here tonight. They're listening to what you've got to say. What do you want to say to the people who are watching? Um, I just really want, want to urge those people that were on the street that night uh, to think about, to just to think about it and to, to come forward. The, uh, the smallest piece of information, anything, would just to come forward. Okay, Hannah. Well, thanks very much for that. You heard Hannah there. It would make a big difference if you could help her to get any information that would find who killed Evan. There's a £5,000 reward. Call 0500 600 600 or 0117 945 5748. Now, from the National Crime and Operations Faculty, here's DS Jackie Haynes. This man seems to be spending a long time deciding on what he wants. He's in a news agent at Brockley in South East London. He takes his money out of his shoe as, is it, as if he's going to buy something, but then he leaves. Minutes later, he's back demanding money. When he's refused, he calls in his mate, who jumps onto the counter and punches the shopkeeper. They steal money and cigarettes. The second man is never that clear, but someone must be able to tell us who this is. The crutches in this CCTV clip appear to be a prop, but this is no actor. Two elderly women were attacked and robbed in their own homes by a man who pushed his way in. This man was seen parking a white Ford Escort outside sheltered housing blocks in Walton, Liverpool and going inside the buildings. On the second occasion, he was seen carrying these crutches. Now, if you recognise any of these men, please call 0500 600 600. Now the stuff of schoolboy dreams. You find yourself watching an armed robbery and you manage to trail the gunman as he tries to get away. Well, in fact, he did get away in this case, but only just, and empty-handed. In fact, quite literally, red-handed, because he didn't realise that most cash boxes are booby-trapped. It was a shambolic end to what he must have thought was so well-planned. It started with three thefts. Taxi markings. Registration plates. and a blue Cavalier SRI, all taken from Sefton, north of Liverpool. The following week, the stolen car was seen in the Meadows Pub car park in Magull. It had the taxi markings and the stolen plate, and maybe you noticed it. It was there for some time. I pulled up outside the bargain booze, um, back to winter past one, went in to do the normal collection. And after making the collection, coming out the store, I saw somebody running towards me. I was petrifying. Didn't really hear him say anything. Then the gun basically speaks for itself. We seen this man run towards us. As he was coming closer, he hesitated to know which way to go. The robber then headed straight for a back garden that backed on to the pub car park. The boys, meanwhile, headed for a vantage point further down the road. and then looked over the Meadows car park wall, seen them running past us, and then through underneath bushes and underneath the bridge.
Dripping wet, but trying to look inconspicuous, he started to change his appearance. I'll sell you a magazine, love. I'll pick it up eventually. It was a programme from an old Everton match, but soaking wet. Excuse me, mate. Italian rubble there's a man came up to me and asked me if he could stand with me because he'd been jumped by a gang of youths. I know, I just want to dirty myself up, make it look as I've been working with you, if that's all right. He's pointed to the boss's van, which was in the driveway, and asked if he could get a lift somewhere because he needed to get away from the area as quick as possible. my van to give you the lift. He was about five, nine to six, two tall, late twenties, Medium build with short brown hair, and he had a deep scout accent. Hello? He moved right, around to the back of the house, and then he looked up in the sky and noticed that there was a police helicopter circling overhead. Is that your van? Yeah, it is, yeah. Could you give us a lift, mate? I'll be ten minutes. No, look, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. Please, please, please I can't please. give you a lift. I don't even know you. I'll only be ten minutes. No, look, what? I'm police everywhere, you know. Don't give the police. Why don't you go and get the police? No, sir. I'll go and give them a shout for you, mate. What? Yeah, go on, you go on. Don't shoot there! Don't call the police! I was concerned. That he may have lashed out and merely predict what he was going to do. Then he rang for a taxi. Hello? And taxi, he knew please. the address immediately. He, he didn't have to ask for this address. He just asked for the taxi to this address. It had taken 10 minutes for the cab to come. The police, meanwhile, were searching the whole area. Whereabouts in Ormskirk do you want to be? Yeah, just the main part. As soon as he went, the builders went straight up the road and told the police what had happened. Is that you? What? The smell of smoke. Yeah, sorry about that. We've been burning rubble and clearing house. You haven't seen a woman round here with a pram, have you? <laughs> There's a lot of those, mate. Yeah. It's me missus, I owe her money. That's why I'm keeping me head low, if you know what I mean. Oh, fair enough. He'd asked to go to Ormskirk, but kept directing the driver down curious routes, and he got out at the Scotch Piper Inn at Lydiard. Look at the EFIT, think of his behaviour, and give us a ring, 0500 600 600, or 0151 treble 7 3166. It's not a particularly busy night tonight. Uh, calls coming in here, as you've heard, about 40 police officers taking those calls. They come here where they're assessed at this desk. I can tell you some of the, the things that to be breaking at the moment. We've got uh, possibly good witness who, who saw the thugs in Birmingham, the, the, the bottle attack. The guy lost his, uh, his eye. I've got three names given on that. One caller thinks he was attacked by the same group of people. On the A2 Indecent Assault, we've got several interesting calls. One suggesting that a particular guy is looked at in a prison that's been named. We've got now 12 names given. And it's probably unconnected, but two girls from the same school were followed by a man uh, in, a, in an F-registered white Ford, and obviously we'll be checking that one out. Don't forget, you can uh, email us, if you want, about any of tonight's cases. The email address is crimewatch at bbc.co.uk, and all the numbers are on CFAX on page 621. This is a clay reconstruction which has been created from a cast of the original skull found in Exmoor National Park. Some of the details may be a guess, hairstyle for example, but it should be good enough for someone to recognise him. Detective Superintendent Barry Douglas is certainly hoping so. The body was found in March this year in a popular walking and horse riding area. At first it was thought it was an animal carcass wrapped in black plastic bags. It was only when the bags were opened it became apparent it was a human being. You're pretty confident that this is a good likeness of, of whoever this man is. What do you know about him? We know he was a dark-skinned male. He probably, his ethnic origin was Middle Eastern, possibly into the Indian subcontinent. You've also got some computer-generated images as well, haven't you? Another way of yes, and of a, a different means him. or a different um, a, a different medium really 
show what he could have been like. What about his age, his, his, his build, that kind of thing? We, we know his age, somewhere between 26 and 36 years of age. He's 5 foot 8, 5 foot 9 inches tall. He was slim build and he had dark, short, straight hair. And he's had um, a, a blow to the jaw? Yes, we know some tw at least 12 months prior to his death um, that he suffered some blow to the mouth, either an assault or an accident. Um, it actually knocked one of the upper teeth, front upper teeth out. And the two teeth in the uh, bottom, on the bottom jaw, on the bottom set of teeth, um, the edges were fractured off, chipped off, and they've been replaced by a dentist by using some tooth-coloured amalgam. But he's used what our experts tell us is uh, a non um, it's a non-standard procedure. procedure. Yes, and um, it's got an amalgam filling right across the two teeth, so you can't clean it properly. So maybe there's a dentist out there that would recognise that sort of work. Well, not having done his job properly. And, and what about when he died? What can you tell us about that? Well, we've had a lot of forensic tests being done on the remains that we have, and only today we've had one expert come back who's telling us this man died probably two and a half years ago. Uh, which is quite an, an exciting for me, an interesting development, because up until then we had no idea when he, di when he died. We know the body was on Exmoor um, in January of this year, and we're pretty certain that it wasn't there in May of last year, due to some aerial photography that was done at that time. So, so the body, therefore, what that means is that, that, that we're talking about a year and a half, maybe two years, when the, the body was stored somewhere, presumably. Yeah. I, and that's why I say it's quite a in, very interesting and, and, and exciting development so for us. So people need to cast their minds back then, what, a, a two and a half years as to, as to when this man may have gone missing. Yeah, that's right. Where has the, the body been prior to it being abandoned or deposited on Exmoor? Now, he was wearing this, this chain. Let me just hold that up for you to see. This is, uh, what, what's this got written on it? It's got a verse from the Holy Quran on it. Um, okay. And it's a bit of a good luck charm. Okay, so this is pretty distinctive. Um, I mean, this man, he's somebody's son, he, he maybe a, a father, maybe a brother. Someone must be missing him. Absolutely. You can't believe that someone has died, been abandoned on Exmoor, and there is not some member of a family, a close friend, a work colleague. Somebody must know him. Somebody must have missed him. And we're hoping with the details that we've given tonight and the reconstruction of the head, that someone will phone in and tell us who he is. Okay. I think it's... Um, you know, it's just the thing for the family to know what's happened to their relative. Of course. Well, if you think you've any information, please call Avon and Somerset Police at their incident room on 01823 363636 or call us here in the studio on 0500 600 600. Let's tell you now about some of the progress from our last programme. Over 200 viewers called in with 40 names for what could be Britain's most prolific sex attacker. He's thought to be responsible for assaulting almost 30 women over four years. There was just a certain smell that he smelled as if he hadn't had a wash for ages. West Midlands police are still working their way through the information. There was also an impressive response to the rape of an 18-year-old in Great Harwood in Lancashire. Several names were put forward more than once, and police are following up those leads. John and Thomas Connors are wanted for distraction burglaries on the elderly, and a call to crime watch pointed to a traveller's camp in Leicestershire. But as the police arrived, a car sped off the wrong way down a dual carriageway. This father and son have so far not been found. There's a strong lead in what seemed to be a small-time crook way out of his league, the bogus postman who threatened and robbed a woman in her home. He said that my husband owed people money, which isn't true, and it, it was like it was his excuse for doing what he was doing. We can't be specific, but the inquiry is making progress. But a thin response to the murder in his garage of Brian Hardwick in Huddersfield. The motive isn't clear, but somehow his own car got a flat tyre and he was murdered as he changed the wheel. We only had a few calls, but there's now a £10,000 reward. As a direct result of calls to Crime Watch, police now think they've identified this man, who may know about fraudulent transactions at the NatWest Bank in Benfleet in Essex. An arrest is likely soon. Computers on the cheap, look who's taking them, and how. 
to have a go that ended with a hit and run. And the gangland style shooting, but did they pick out a grandfather at random? The thieves who targeted a company in Kensington, West London, knew what they were looking for. Computers. Sun microsystems, to be precise. They're fairly common computers in medium to large companies. So if you're being offered parts or spares that don't come from your normal supplier, watch this. I was sitting watching TV, and when I saw something appear in the glass window, so when I get up and I went to the door, then I see this guy, he was standing there with the tie on. He showed me the ID card and he says he's a member of the staff. Somehow, three men had already got through the main security downstairs. And they looks quite reasonable, no suspicious or anything. So I just slide you open the door. Yeah, hang on a sec. Jeez, Suddenly, this guy, he take the knife out. I was scared, you know, shocked, like I couldn't believe it. The robbers plainly had inside knowledge. Maybe one worked for a computer contractor. At least they knew exactly where to go. One of them threatened the guard. The others went for computer equipment, but especially E4000 memory cards. They also took two rack-mounted enterprise servers. One then donned hat and glasses, but none of them seem too concerned about the security camera. In fact, the images aren't that good, but they might just be good enough. There's a £10,000 reward. I said, you know, they're going to stab me or, you know, going to kill me because they don't want to leave any evidence. It's a nightmare. I mean, it's when you think back and you come back to the same side, it's hard. Have another look. If you might know where the stolen kit went, or think you know any of the robbers, we're waiting for your call. 0500 600 600. Lincolnshire police want to talk to Ian Fricker. The Orders of St John Trust Charity discovered that a cheque had been missing. It's been used to steal over £6,500. Ian Fricker may be able to help the inquiry. Parvez Khan has been charged with death, causing death by dangerous driving in Staffordshire. He disappeared before his trial and even his family say they haven't heard from him. Maybe you have. Officers in West Yorkshire need to find Matthew Nuttall. On two occasions he's involved innocent women in bank fraud in the Leeds Bradford area. Matthew Nuttall may now be living in London. And Demetrius Cipriano didn't turn up at Oxford Magistrates Court over a year ago. He was charged with conning two pensioners into handing over £4,000 for a loft conversion, which never happened. He could be in Cyprus or still in the UK. This man, Martin Jackson, is wanted for questioning by police on Merseyside, investigating the importation of millions of pounds worth of cocaine, ecstasy and amphetamine. He has links in London, the Netherlands and Spain. And Liverpool CID are after Joseph Barton, who's not been seen since January after the fatal stabbing of a shop owner in the city. He could be travelling with his girlfriend in, and he may be in North Wales or the north of England. And it's really important that we find Brahim Yadugi, wanted in connection with the attempted murder of a woman in Wilsdon in northwest London six weeks ago. The victim was dragged along the road with a ligature round her throat. Yadugi could also be using the name Jean-Paul Christophe Dubois. And this is Arcado Alberto de Mella. Another stabbing, this time in Shelton, Stoke-on-Trent, left a young man in hospital seriously injured. We need to find him. He's been eluding us since January. If you see him, don't approach him. Ring us straight away. A nice weekend in Wolverhampton. A good time to go and look for a new car. On a typical week, you'll sell 70% of your cars over a weekend. And the busiest day generally is Saturday. Cheers, I was with some people um, in the showroom when these two guys came in and asked the spec on a certain car. Oh. Can I help you guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, just been looking on the forecourt of some rovers. I'm interested in a 2.5 litre. I believe you've got one on there, the blue one. Uh, just let me check my list. I hadn't sold a car that day, and that was going to be quite a profitable sale to me, so um, I was quite keen to sell that car, I have to admit. So this will be the uh, original blue one that you saw? Uh, two litre, yeah. yeah, no, it's definitely a 2.5 we're wanting. Right, well, we've got the silver one in a 2.5 here, uh, but this one is uh, automatic. No, you see, this, this is for our uncle, you see, and um, 
He's preferring uh, definitely a manual. That's what, that's what I'm on the market for, yeah. Well, the only manual one that we do have is the Moonsong Green one here, which is... The car was a very high-spec vehicle. It was top-of-the-range, two-and-a-half-litre Rover Connoisseur SE, so it had leather interior, climate control, cruise control, every toy known to man. It was a very, very attractive car. I mean, it would normally retail new for about 23000 I suppose, and we had it up for about sixteen. They seem very genuine in their intention to purchase. Their story tied up. Um, they asked the right questions. They wanted to know the right information. There was nothing suspicious in their um, approach at all. And at that point on a Saturday afternoon with somebody very, very keen to purchase a car, um, I was very keen to pursue the matter. All right, there we are then. Will you be requiring finance uh, for the vehicle? No, no uh, paying cash. All right. Do you mind if we take it for a test drive? No, not at all. It's an inevitable part of any sales process is that people are going to want to drive the car. Yeah, no problem. Once I'd ascertained that they uh, didn't have any driving licences on them and that I was going to drive the vehicle, I took the car around to the local garage to put some fuel in it. The bigger of the two guys said, uh, I'll just wait here and uh, see you when you get back. I thought, great, as far as I was concerned. only meant I had to talk to one of them. Well, we've just been uh, thinking... Um, yeah? My friend here, I'll go on the uh, drive with All you. All right, fair enough. Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll wait here for you. You wait here. Right. Okay. I got in the car, he hopped in the passenger seat and uh, off we went. Yes. It's got full cruise control, so that, uh, you know, if you're doing any long journeys on the motorway, you, for your comfort, click it onto cruise control and away you go. So what did you say the uh, brake was power was? Just short of 180. You know. The test drive had gone fine. Uh, he was asking a lot of questions. I was explaining and demonstrating the car and the various functions of it as we were driving. He seemed quite impressed with it. Just put your foot down for me, mate. OK, my pleasure. <laughs> Alarm bells only went when he unclipped his seatbelt. Pull over. <laughs> Don't fucking pull over! Look, don't ask questions, pull over! I'd been out for a bike ride. Uh, it was on my way back home when the vehicle, three cars in front, actually stopped in the middle of the road you make the assumption in a split second that it is in fact a carjacking taking place. I couldn't do anything for the driver, so uh, consequently I, I took the, the decision then and there to follow the vehicle from a safe distance so I could actually report to the police its eventual location. When I started to follow the vehicle, I could actually see it disappear at a great rate of knots. That again confirmed my suspicions that this vehicle had just been stolen. In that particular instance, a motorcycle will keep up with a motor car in traffic and it will not lose it because you've obviously got more acceleration, you've got, you can go into tighter gaps. So it's the ideal, it was in the ideal situation to do something about what I presume to have been a crime that had been committed. He was taking a lot of chances. He was overtaking vehicles on pieces of road that even on a motorcycle I'd think twice about doing. As long as I could keep him in my sights, I knew that he wasn't going to get away. So I followed it for about three miles and ended up at Vicar Street in Sedgley, whereby he was stuck at a busy junction. Once the, the vehicle had struck the bike and then obviously accelerated away, this is my pride and joy that's lying on its side. I never even looked at the damage. All I set my mind on was catching the guy who had just done it. So I then obviously followed it for about another five miles. He'd gone through red traffic lights, obviously I'd stopped. So at that point, I then gave up the chase and phoned 999. Once I'd made the call, stood back and looked at my bike, I actually physically was shaking. It's purely the strength of the motorcycle itself and its size, which has saved it, saved me from any serious injuries. John's such a brave man. Is he getting some recognition? Yes, he is. He's uh, being given a certificate of commendation. Uh, and in addition, the garage are paying to repair his motorbike. Now, the Rover 75 that he was chasing, the stolen one, still missing a month later, might have been sold, might still be on the market. And it's very distinctive because of the combination. Now, describe what a potential buyer should look for. It is very distinctive. It's a, a combination of cream leather upholstery and a manual gearbox, which is, is very unusual, that combination. It's also got all the extras like cruise control inside it. And satellite navigation. That's right. And everything. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of silver green colour. Yes, Assuming it, it hasn't been resprayed. Re I, yes. I think it's called a moonstone green or something. But these plates that were in it, yes. they've gone too. Yes. 
those uh, are the trade plates, they may still be in circulation somewhere else, and that's the correct number, 4020 OK, someone might find them on a, on a rubbish dump or whatever. Car only had, what, five quids worth of fuel? Yes. He just went, as we saw, to, to put some petrol in the, you know, and then, then take him on the test drive. That's going to go, what, 30 miles? So somewhere pretty close by, he's, he's had to put petrol in. Yes, we'd be very interested to hear from any people, perhaps, who were working in garages on the evening of the 13th of April. That's a Saturday evening. That's right. right. Six o'clock, was it? Somewhere? Saturday evening, some, about 6 p.m., yes. Maybe they were working there and someone came in to buy fuel. Uh, this particular man who'd taken the vehicle, maybe they remember him. Maybe it's on CCTV. And maybe these trade plates uh, are still in the car. Yes. Who knows? Um, obviously, we want other witnesses when, yes. when this happened. The descriptions. Yes. Now, you haven't, for legal reasons, you haven't got EFIT, yes. but tell us what you know, particularly about the guy who was driving the car. Yeah, the, the, the man who took the vehicle is described as an Asian male, about five foot seven tall, slim build, with short dark hair, and he was wearing quite a distinctive beige PVC jacket. Okay. Thank you, John. If you know who it was, if you've got any ideas, give us a call, please, 0500 600 600 or 01 785 234 435. Detectives in Warwickshire are completely baffled by this next case and hoping that someone watching tonight might be able to shed some light. Terry Morgan, ordinary man, a 69-year-old pensioner, grandfather of 10, was murdered in a gangland-style shooting just outside his home on the Brownsover estate in Rugby. He'd been to pick up his wife from work, drove them both home. He was just getting out of his car when someone came up and shot him in the chest. Ken, why would someone want to, to murder Terry? The fact is, it's, it's exactly three weeks ago to the night. In fact, it's almost three weeks ago to the minute that Terry was murdered. Uh, and we still don't have any clear indication as to the reason or the motive for that murder. I mean, could he have upset somebody? Is that possible? Um, yes, he could. I mean, there must be a reason, of course. And uh, it's been suggested that um, Terry was a campaigner you know, against drugs in his area. Well, we haven't found any evidence of that. I mean, we know that Terry contacted uh, a couple of local councillors um, sometime over the last seven uh, to eight months Again, with, with other residents in the area, uh, not alone. So, you know, he did it as, as, as a group, really, um, to complain about noise and nuisance uh, and drugs. Well, but so that's hardly a reason for someone to... No, hardly a motive for, for, for a murder. And what, I mean, could he have had a secret past, perhaps? Well, yeah, I mean, there must be a reason why Terry Morgan was murdered. And whether that's uh, something from his personal past life, uh, I don't know. But everybody describes Terry as a pleasant, a likeable 69-year-old pensioner, uh, the sort of chap that will say hello to you in the street, certainly not the sort of man who goes away and seeks confrontation of any kind. I suppose it's always possible it could have been a case of mistaken identity perhaps. Yes, it could. Um, that's something that we've got to consider al along with everything else and we need to keep a you know, very open mind about where we're going. But um, yeah, it could be any number of things and, and, and I would like anybody, you know, I would urge anybody who has any information whatsoever who thinks they might know the reason why Terry was murdered to, to contact us. Now, you haven't got a lot to go on, but there is a car you're particularly interested in, isn't yes, there? Yes, we know that the, the car, the escape car, if you like, was uh, a dark uh, coloured mid-sized saloon, probably with four doors and a boot. Uh, we also know, interestingly, that um, a maroon or red coloured Ford Orion, uh, during the two weeks prior to Terry's murder, was seen in the cul-de-sac where he lives. Uh, the car was seen to drive in slowly, turn around and drive out again for no apparent reason. Um, the car, we believe, had a D in its registration number. So again, if anybody knows anything about that car or the owner or the driver of that car, please contact us. Okay, well, please help us get to the bottom of this. There's a reward, it's 5,000 pounds. If you know something, you might be the person to get it. 0500 600 600. I hope we're going to have quite a bit of information to give you in about half an hour's time. I tell you, we might have an identification of the clay head, the, of the body that was found on Exmoor. On the A2 assault, a lot of calls on this, but particularly a relative of a former sex offender who's rung up and said he's pretty sure that it is his relative. It absolutely fits the description of the EFIT. And the Evan Jones murder, uh, one caller has rung in and offered a reward on John and Thomas Connor. We've got some rather interesting information. That's the father and son we've been seeking. Okay, well, our phone lines are open till midnight tonight and again from 7.30 tomorrow morning until midnight. We'll be back at 10.35 with the Crime Watch update. Remember, Crime Watch collects up the horrid things that happen. That's the nature of appeals, but in real life, these crimes are really few and far between, so don't have nightmares. Not an hour account, at least. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.